My name is Julie Rosenberg and I'm the executive officer of Aiden. I want to start today by acknowledging the traditional owners of the country. Today I'm tuning in um, from this event from the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation. I also want to give thanks for their continuing care for and connection to land, sea and community. We respect their elders, past, future and emerging. So just a teeny introduction of Aiden, and that is just to say that we have a pretty clear message, I think. We're about more and better giving and investing from Australia to international development. We're interested in collaborating and building on the existing ecosystem to encourage and facilitating giving and investing internationally. We've seen overnight the significant cut in the UK's foreign aid budget. Um, it's gone from 07 to 0.5%. And I have no doubt it's the popular vote of the economic effects of the pandemic. And truly, I can understand it, but I really believe that a better outcome for all of us would be if at this time we were to increase foreign spending all round. That would serve us all so well. Um, the end of the sort of doom and gloom. Today, um, we're hoping that today will be a part of a longer conversation. Um, and it just, it sprung from a conversation with just interesting people as always. And we thought we'd grab the opportunity to share Rashini's uh, presentation. Um, and we'd actually sort of shine a light on some recent indicators, which are, which are not great. Um, and it's on the continued disparity in gender equality. On the key metrics that measure global gender gap, we are going backwards. This was prior to the pandemic, and probably I don't need to tell anybody on the network that the pandemic has not helped at all. So we can get going and um, get to hear a bit more from Rashini. I'm going to introduce Bruce Jones, who's currently the Director of Global Markets in country, in Australia and New Zealand country rep for AVPN. And she will facilitate our awesome specialist panel today. And it is my pleasure to introduce her. Ruth is the network queen, having worked with donor and philanthropic networks in Australia, the US and Canada. She's focused on supporting individual donors, foundations and institutions to develop and implement their giving strategies. For 10 years based in the state, she was CEO of the Social Venture Partners Network, the largest network of engaged donors operating globally. For this, Ruth was with Community Foundations of Canada and Philanthropy Australia. And it was to Ruth that I turned to when I was first looking at how we might go about setting up this network. So I'm indebted to her, thrilled that she is here and leading this session. So Ruth, over to you. Oh, thanks, Julie. Well, what a lovely intro. Um, that's my ego stroke for the day. Thank you. Uh, Welcome. I'm I'm the, I'm, the uh, I'm not the main event here. That is Roshani Prakash, AVPN's Director of Knowledge and Insights, who is joining us from uh, AVPN's Singapore office. Uh, now, Roshani uh, leads our efforts uh, in knowledge and insights, preparing social investment landscape reports, insights, uh, statistical analysis of uh social investment trends uh in asia pacific previously she uh was at the singapore center for voluntary oh um rosh i've forgotten the name of it um the center for voluntary uh the national volunteer and philanthropy center in that's singapore. right that's right where she led primary and secondary qualitative research to focused on strategic impactful and sustained giving She's written numerous papers on philanthropy and social enterprise uh, at the center. And she has also worked in to support research capacity building and advocacy on aid effectiveness for the Asian Development Bank. So Roshni is going to both uh, be our main presenter today. She's also going to give you a little bit of background about the AVPN network. Uh, at the start of her pre presentation. So please take it away, Rosh. 
Thanks so much, Ruth. Um, I'm not really good at tech, so give me a second to share my screen. I hope this comes up well. Okay. Um, does that look good? Yeah. Great. Uh, thanks, Ruth. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and thanks to Aidan for, for inviting me. Let me start with some words on who we are at AVPN. We are a network of funders and resource providers headquartered in Singapore, but with over 600 members across 32 markets. So the majority of our membership is based in Asia Pacific, but about 20% sit outside the region and invest into it. Uh, our mission is to move more capital towards impact in this region by providing social investors opportunities to connect with key stakeholders across sectors and markets to learn from one another and then to find opportunities for action. As Ruth mentioned, my role is to lead the knowledge and insights team, which sits within the products pillar. And we support our members with a range of research and best practice on social investment approaches. And it's a pleasure to be working alongside Ruth and being here today with you all. So I think nobody in the room will be surprised by the figures that you see on the screen right now. Even before COVID-19 hit, as um, Julie mentioned earlier, the economic costs of gender inequality and persistent disparities in employment opportunities, wages and access to credit were clearly visible not only at the household level or the national level, but globally. And today, the world is in its first she session I borrowed that from the New York Times. Thanks, Ruth. Um, we've had over a year of on again, off again lockdowns and all that has meant in terms of working from home, school and care home closures and travel restrictions. Through all of this, women have filled in the gaps. Some have had to leave school and jobs entirely to meet child and elder care needs. And for those who remain, the demands of care reduce their ability to be present and productive at work. And all of this leads to declining efficiency and output for business. And as we rebuild, we're going to need a tremendous amount of investment capital, particularly in industries such as tourism and hospitality, which in fact employ a disproportionate number of women. So in rebuilding, there needs to be an eye to inequality, to worker empowerment, to providing either compensation for care and domestic work or access to talent and services that can provide these so that women can be fully present at work. Otherwise, as we all know, everything's at risk. The wages at risk, economic stability at risk, participation in education that leads to permanent employment also will be at risk. Women-led businesses are an investment in economic resilience. I don't think anybody would contest that. Uh, women as um, ethnic, racial minorities, any other minority group have consistently experienced structural inequities in business. So if they've had to identify ways to be successful without the resources available to uh, more privileged groups. And so they've built models to be stable in scarcity. So investments in these businesses are obviously an opportunity to further resilient economic recovery. And the third point is that essential goods will continue to constitute the bulk of spending by families and women are the ones making or influencing 70 to 80% of these purchases. So there's no doubt that without taking women into consideration, there's no way we're going to be building back stronger and better post COVID. Now I'm here representing AVPN. Um, and I thought it would be important at this point to talk about what our members are doing. Two out of three members at AVPN are committed to supporting women and girls or um, gender equality as one of their primary impact areas. And this extends beyond supporting women as mothers, but also building their capacity so that their assets to the community and to the workforce. And as you see on the screen, an equal percentage of our members provide grants as they do invest through debt and equity. What you'll notice also is that while around 20% put a gender lens to impact measurement, less than that apply a gender lens when actually choosing a project or an investment. So we're still at early stages of this, and I think that's reflective of the market at large. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about gender lens investing. 
uh, Julie Riley will be speaking about philanthropy and then I think Deb is going to be talking about social movements with women and I think we need to talk about all of this because all of these together is what's going to help us address the issues at hand. So just to focus here on gender lens investing, I think the name um, tells us really what it is, is self-explanatory. It's investing with the intent to address gender issues or promote gender equi equity by investing in women-owned or led enterprises, investing enterprises that promote uh, workplace equity in staffing, management, boardroom representation along the supply chain, and or investing in enterprises that uh, see women and girls as the end consumer and offer products or services that substantially improve their lives. Right now, the impact investing market globally is around 715 million, a billion US dollars. And um, gender equality is, I think, the number six priority, not even the top five yet, but you know, growing in uh, value and importance. In Asia, where I'm based, GLI as a strategy has been growing in strength. Um, and today, Asia is the second largest market in the world. Most of this um, has been led by private market investment vehicles. Um, and while the quantum is still small, it's still about 815 million uh, USD. The capital has increased by 350% between 2018 to 2019. So the, the step change um, in interest and the amount of capital invested is, is growing at a rate that um, is, is quite remarkable actually. So globally, there are about 192 um, active gender lens investment vehicles and a total AUM of about 7.7 .7 billion US dollars. And this also has increased by about 60% from the year before. Um, global leaders are gathering in Cornwall for the G7 summit and uh, the discussion is gonna be taking place next week. The last time they met, it was pre-pandemic. So naturally, a major focus of their conversation will be how the world can rebuild and recover since the impact of the virus. When they last met in June 2018, the G7 launched the 2X challenge. And this was seen as a major commitment of their development finance institutions to unlock resources to help advance women's economic empowerment and gender equality. The goal was 3 billion US dollars by 2020. And yes, you can see on the chart, they've raised 1.5 times the amount. That, that speaks to the commitment and the priority that Gender Lens has received from the top echelons of government. And I hope when they meet this week or next week, they'll reinforce this commitment. Now, so far I've shared the social case, the economic case and the global policy imperative. The business case is pretty clear as well. Research by the International Finance Corporation and others in the last five years or so have shown that gender balanced and gender diverse teams have outperformed in terms of returns on equity, share price performance and growth. A recent report by the IFC, along with Oliver Wyman and Rock Creek, uh, drew on gender diversity and performance data for, from over 700 funds and 500 portfolio companies. And this showed that PE and VC funds in emerging markets, which had gender balanced senior investment teams, generate about 10 to 20% higher returns compared with funds that have majority male or female leaders. At the same time, portfolio companies with gender balanced leadership teams outperform in valuation increases by about 25% compared to non-diverse teams. So the case is pretty clear to me. So if you're an investor, what should you do? How, how do you respond to this? And I think the role of investor is quite a powerful one because you can actually um, demonstrate and consider the uh, gender implications of everything that you do and see how you can bring it to light in different ways as an advocate. So if you invest in a listed fund or firm, then choose those that perform well in gender equity so that you drive capital to the better actors. If you're seeding new vehicles, choose to fund those that address issues that disproportionately affect women. And if you're working with funds and investment managers, then require them to address gender dynamics by shifting their processes, their teams, their structures. 
there's so much that you can do is just about being focused on it from from the get go rather than at the end. So having said all of this, uh, I must highlight that uh, good intentions doesn't mean that this will always be easy. While capital is increasing, the need has been established, there are some constraints. For instance, if you go into uh, gender lens investing, looking for data that is equivalent to what you would require in a mainstream environment, investment environment, you'll find that the data doesn't exist. This is something that is currently being built. So it is coming. It's just that it's not available to the degree of granularity and comparability that you may be accustomed to. Part of the issue is that smaller businesses can find the reporting and measurement requirements burdensome. So they don't have the resources to dedicate to impact assessment that is gendered. So rather than asking for it, perhaps the, the point here is to give them the resources to build their capacity to integrate gender reporting into the existing protocols so that they can then be reporting with the granularity that investors require. All of this uh, investment and relationship is all about trust anyway. So it's about a partnership between the investor and investee. And when your values are aligned and your goals are aligned, it's easy to, to carry the path forward. By building trust at a time when we cannot travel, our meet face to face is always challenging, right? So it's about uh, reinforcing to the investee uh, that uh, you as an investor work alongside them and that you believe in the enterprise uh, that they are building. So on that note, um, let me speak about some of the innovative approaches that we've seen in the AVPN network. The first one is in Indonesia. Um, it's called Biduk. It was launched in March 2019 as an attempt to kind of bridge the credit gap for women owned small and growing businesses. It offers flexible commercially priced debt products for women entrepreneurs that range between uh, 15,000 and 75,000 US dollars. It's incredibly helpful, especially in the moment because several businesses have gone through tough times and they need access to small loans to buy them some time to rethink their strategy, pivot their business and explore alternatives before they approach larger investors. The second one is Yellow Dog. Now, Yellow Dog um, is a South Korean fund, and they arrived at their GLI strategy less intentionally. They launched as a traditional uh, venture capital firm and then realized, the investment partners that is, they realized that they were one of the very few venture capital firms in the country with female founders. And that just became their competitive advantage. So they launched their first GLI fund in 2018, the Yellow Dog Empowers fund and that was 5 million USD in size and that focused on investing in women owned and women led businesses in South Korea and now it's got a second GLI fund in the works which it uh, aims to expand outside Korea into Vietnam and Indonesia as well. Another innovation that has been picking up um, of late is gender linked impact bonds. And some of you might be aware of the Impact Investment Exchange, also based in Singapore, headquartered here, um, and their Women's Livelihood Bond Series. Now, the third bond in the series was successfully priced in December 2020. Um, and overall, the series is about 150 million US dollars um, and aims to support about 3 million women across developing countries. ADB, Asian Development Bank, also has been um, issuing gender bonds since 2017. And they've issued about 305 million USD in bonds so far. And this is really in response to the growing awareness amongst institutional investors like themselves of a need to more responsible approach to investment. And they're using the money that they've raised through these bonds to um, increase women's income and support those who want to start businesses in developing countries. Um, I thought I'd mention a partnership because the initial ones were all uh, single 
investor funds. Uh, Moonshot Ventures and YCAP Ventures partnered last year to launch the Indonesia Women's Empowerment Fund. Uh, this one is problem driven, which is really interesting, and it offers solutions that are cross cutting, um, which appreciates that actually uh, women are the linchpin for several issues that affect different dimensions and different sectors, education, healthcare, financial services. Um, and this one is also in Indonesia. Now, having said all of this, um, I wanted to say a little bit about what we are doing at EVPN. Um, we're, as a funders network, really in a good uh, position to kind of highlight the work that our members are doing and to kind of inspire them uh, to bring others along in their journey. So in March this year, we launched the Asia Gender Network, which is a platform for Asian philanthropists to learn from one another and the broader AVPN network, of course, which is centered around the goal of being united as long-term donors to equality of women and girls. So we have around, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Ruth, about uh, just over 20 members at the moment. And Grace Forrest is our Australian representative. I think we're up to about 35 now. Are we now? Okay. Hmm. See, I'm behind the times. Um, in July, we are going to be launching a six-month fellowship program for wealth owners and capital allocators around a gender lens investment. Um, and that will run for, for six months. And then in October, we're going to have a lot of content on the AVPN Academy. Uh, that speaks to those looking to learn about different ways of making an impact for women and girls. So that brings me to the la last slide. And on this slide, I wanted to draw your attention to some resources. Uh, we have a gender platform on the AVPN website that shows the different ways our members are working together. Uh, you can access it through the URL or this uh, fancy QR code. Um, to find others who may be doing something similar to what you're doing, or maybe who could provide you with uh, new insight and inspiration. And then on the other side of the slide, three reports that I thought were quite useful, the GIN Annual Impact Investment Survey, uh, the Gender Lens Investing Landscape done by Saskawa Peace Foundation last year, and then the MasterCard Index of Women Entrepreneurs, which I found really informative. All right, Ruth, uh, that's it from me. Uh, over to you. Oh, thank you, Rosh. And frankly, I cannot believe that gender is sixth on the list of issues. I mean, I expect that climate action is probably number one. T can you tell us what's ahead of, do you know off, by, off, off just- I don't know off, off the top of my head, but I can find out. Give me two minutes, okay. I'll be back. Uh, because I am really staggered to find that gender does not make it into the top five. But uh, let's turn now to Julie Riley. Uh, Julie is going to give us, I think, some... Julie's going to take us to uh, the philanthropic landscape and what's happening with respect in the gender space with respect to that. I think many of you will know Julie as the CEO of Australians Investing in Women. She's a passionate advocate about sharing the benefits of investing in women and girls through philanthropy and social investment. And Australians Investing in Women is a leading national not-for-profit advocate for gender-wise philanthropy, taking an evidence-based approach and working in partnership with philanthropic corporate and community leaders to strengthen society by catalyzing investing in women and girls. Julie, we'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ruth. And thanks, um, Julie Rosenberg, and to everyone else. It's great to be part of this conversation. Um, Roshini, I have to say that was actually really heartening to hear what you had to say about what's going on with AVPN. And you've kind of given me a bit of a gold standard to work to if we could develop um, similar levels of sophistication with those, <clears throat> pardon me, networks in Australia around uh, philanthropy. Um, so to pick up on Ruth's point, some of you will uh, know Australians Investing in Women has been around for about 10 years under a different brand, Australian Women Donors Network. But um, back late last year, we relaunched for a very good reason. And that um, 
really is, is most clearly said that it is not purely the responsibility of women to fund the gender inequality gap. It's um, about impact and it's about a responsibility for all of us to make sure that we're building the fairest future and having the greatest impact that we can. Um, so our part of this ecosystem is actually um, at this point focused very squarely on philanthropic granting and philanthropic practice more broadly. There's a lot of interest um, in, I have a lot of people coming to us really interested in gender lens investing and in impact investing through a gender lens. And it's wonderful to be able to connect to other organisations where that's your main focus and expertise. So this is our first partnership of, um, event together and I'm really excited about it. Uh, I'm particularly excited that there's a lot of good news in your slides about that growth in gender lens investing because some of the information I'll share today is perhaps not as great. Um, so I want to talk a little bit first about what the most recent World Economic Forum statistics tell us um, globally and particularly in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, and then I'll speak a little bit about some research that we've done ourselves on the impact of COVID uh, in Australia, directing philanthropists to where those biggest black spots have been for women and how they could invest to greatest impact for the recovery. And I think as um, both Julie and Ruth talked about, this is about actually understanding how we can best recover from the, the, the massive impact of COVID-19 around the world. Um, so just to talk a little bit about the World Economic Forum report, it's the 15th of its kind, and it assesses 156 countries across a set of um, metrics that talk about how close they are to closing the gender gap. And that's in areas of health, education, work and political empowerment. Um, I guess it won't surprise anyone. The first thing to note is that there is not one single country that reports as being fully equal, um, but the countries that stand out as the best performers are the Scandinavian countries. Uh, Iceland tops the list for the 12th year in a row, followed by Norway, Finland and Sweden. Uh, Afghanistan is the worst performing country and if we look a little to our region, India is the third worst performing country in Southeast Asia. Um, so what are the findings more specifically around here um, and across the report? Sadly, uh, the trend, as I think Roshini alluded to, is one of overall decline. Uh, the latest metrics show that we have slid backwards um, by its 0.6 percentage point, but it's across a whole range of metrics. Uh, and that's mainly due to the performance of larger countries. So on the current trajectory, some of, this will, some of you will have heard this, it will take us 135.6 years to reach um, uh, gender equality globally. Uh, I don't know about you, I find that utterly unacceptable. Uh, and just to see how quickly things can change, the last report showed it was close to 100 years. So it was just under 100 years, 99.5, I think. So there's some really significant issues that we have the opportunity to address through both philanthropic giving and gender lens investing. Um, so there is some good news that um, East Asia and the Pacific region were among the most improved in this current report, but Having said that, at the current pace, the gender gaps can potentially be closed in that region in 165 years. So they're about 30 years behind the estimates for the rest of the world. Um, Australia, while it's fourth in our immediate region, is number 50 overall. And some of you will remember that we did once have a, a very proud ranking, I think, of 15th back in uh, 2006. So as a country, we've got a lot of work to do as well. Uh, and I think, um, again, speaking about the region, the gender gap um, in political empowerment remains the largest of the four focus areas. Um, and it's East Asia and the Pacific where that has regressed um, to the greatest level. 
Notably, Indonesia experienced a decline in the share of women in ministerial positions to 17% from 23%, 23.5%. Uh, uh, and the gender gap in economic participation and opportunity remains the second largest gap. And, and those of you who've looked at Australia a bit more closely will see that women's workforce participation is one of the biggest issues we face. We, we consistently rank number one, um, or we get a top ranking for the education of women. Um, but when it comes to workforce participation for a lot of barriers, there are a lot of barriers, we're at number 70 as a country. Um, so just going back to the region uh, a little bit more, there are four countries in East Asia and the Pacific that have achieved at least 99.5% gender parity in education, which is fantastic. Um, led by Australia and New Zealand, but um, we also have the other end of the spectrum where in Myanmar, the literacy rate amongst women um, is lower than, it, it's around 70%. So uh, when you look at the World Economic Forum report, it doesn't define exactly what, how much time it will take us to close the health and survival gap that remains undefined. But East Asia and the Pacific has narrowed this gap somewhat, but there has been not virtually no progress uh, made over the last 15 years. So we've really got significant work to do. So what are those solutions? And I loved, uh, Roshini, that you were able to point to really concrete investment vehicles. I keep hearing from people that there's a lack of vehicles and opportunities to invest. So I'm gonna be really excited to be able to point people um, to the sort of projects that you highlighted. But uh, the report tells us, and I'm looking at the um, DFAT's Investing in Women website, where they talk about the main way to pave a more gender equal future is actually um, further investments into the care sector and in, in, into equitable access um, to care for both men and women. Um, again, some similarities you'll see with people um, who are talking about the, the barriers in Australia. Uh, policies and practices that proactively focus on overcoming occupational segregation by gender. Um, in the, the region, as well as in Australia, the industries that have been hardest hit by the, the pandemic are industries where women are dominant. Uh, and certainly in Australia, it's younger women who've taken that double whammy, where um, both being female and young has put you at the worst possible um, situation. Uh, so we, uh, I, I'm very aware that this is about investing in the region. We do have um, a really detailed and comprehensive research report on the impacts in Australia. We might wait for the conversation for that, um, but thank you. And I will hand back to you, Ruth. Thank you. There are some um, worrying stats there. Uh, thank you, Julie. But maybe Deborah can get us our mood swinging upwards <laughs> again a little bit because when we uh, gathered in advance of uh, our session today to discuss uh, approaches or responses to the gender inequity that we're seeing, Deborah told us about some very interesting strategic decisions that uh, International Women's Development Agency has taken recently. And I'm going to invite her to uh, speak to them. Deborah is the Development Manager at uh, International Women's Development Agency, which works in uh, Cambodia, Myanmar, PNG, Timor-Leste, Solomons and Fiji, focused on women's leadership and participation, safety and security, economic empowerment and systemic change. And we'd love to hear from you, uh, Deborah, about this um, about this this core topic. Well, thank you very much, Ruth, and thank you to you and Roshini and Julie and Julie uh, for inviting IWDA to belong. I think I've made that terrible error of a person in lockdown and I haven't spoken this morning <laughs> before coming onto this webinar. So I feel a little bit scratchy and if I have to stop for a glass of water, that will be why. Um, uh, 
what I'd like to do is just suggest uh, probably um, I'd like to talk about two areas, but one is really to just take a step further the areas for investing that Roshini outlined and um, put to you the value of investing in movements. And uh, I think we all around us, wherever we are, can um, have very close proximity to movements that have had very substantial or change in the communities in which we live over even just the last couple of years. Um, in Australia, you can think of the, the movement for marriage equality and the mobilization of <coughs> um, GTB, LTIQ people towards that end. Um, we can look globally at the Black Lives Matter movement in uh, just the resurgence of that movement in just the last year and the impact that has had. And one of the things that we've, oh, and I, I should say over not only a century, but centuries, waves of the women's movement, feminist movements towards change for women. Um, some of us have lived through various phases of that, but um, those movements have been key to making change. And um, one of the things that IWDA recognises is that without the activity of the people themselves who are involved, who are affected by discrimination or disadvantage, change does not happen. And so another way to look at investment is that you can look at investment in those very drivers of change through movements. And that's one of the focus areas for IWDA moving forward. What that might look like <clears throat> might not be as clear cut as investing in a women led business or investing in products and services. And what that might look like also is um, investing in a future that you want to see that doesn't come with guaranteed returns at any point, but history shows um, leads to the sort of change that will benefit any investment in any country where um, subject, subjugation of women is act, leads to all of those factors that Roshini outlined in, in her presentation. Um, in, the, in, the, um, in the last year following on from um, events in the US and uh, the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement, Philanthropy in particular, but also private investment has invested massively in movements towards racial equity. It's in the billions of dollars. And um, as I've been tracking this, most of it has gone to civil society for uh, to push towards change and has recognized that who leads those movements is critical and important. Just yesterday, I am um, one of those givers, not, not Probably the most progressive was the Chan Zuckerberg initiative. This is um, Zuckerberg of Facebook fame, of course, who gave 500 million last year to racial equity. And uh, just uh, in the last week, they've identified that a hundred of a million of that has gone to support organizations. And this is the way they, they framed the term that IWDA is calling movement strengthening. Um, creating conditions for organizations, communities, and individuals at the front lines of the fight for equity to thrive. So that to me is a, another definition of putting money into strengthening movements towards social change. One of the things that requires from the giver, whatever modality you use to give, is a more flexible approach. Um, this form of funding that is going out is less tied to a whole set of predetermined outcomes. It, it uh, trusts the organisations to know best how change might happen. And it also has to accept that um, in, in social change, there are zeitgeist moments. Sometimes they, and often they are triggered by tragedy. I mean, I'm hoping today that the, the little girl who's on being moved to Perth from Christmas Island to hospital with septicemia is a moment that might trigger some change in the Australian government's attitude 
to not just that family, but other people left in limbo as refugees. George Floyd's murder. Um, we understand it here in Australia with specific incidents of, of violence against women that trigger moments of change. But the movement for change needs to be strong to take, a, to take those moments and move forward and walk forward. And the investment of, um, of all of us in those movements over the long term means that there is a powerful group of women ready to act when moments allow us to have real impact. So I would encourage you to think about that as a form of investment and, um, and definitely we're interested to have a conversation with you if you'd like to follow up on that. The second area I'd like to just highlight quickly is the importance of data. Um, quite often we are stuck within uh, those advocating for women with having to quote from the data that exists about situation for women. And many, many, many of us, Roshini included and Julie included, are working to provide better data from which decisions can be made. And um, this is also important for those of you who are investors at any point of an investment decision that you're making, which there are lots of points along that spectrum, to understand where the data comes from, has it actually included women? Has it asked the right questions? Um, when we're thinking, Julie Riley mentioned the importance of investing in care work. Um, has it taken account of unpaid care work that women do? Has that been acknowledged um, in the data that's been created? IWDA has its own project in this area, which is called Quality Insights. Its focus is on how globally poverty is measured, which the, the big institutions, World Bank and so forth, use a measure of poverty um, that asks the head of a household to identify the resources that household does. That doesn't take us a long time to think who they would generally ask that question of as the head of a household. And, um, what information that person might give from their genuine perspective, which may not be the same as for the woman inside the house who may be doing many more hours of unpaid labor, who may be the person getting the water that isn't supplied to the house, who may not be earning a cash income, but is supporting the ha household through farming, gardening, um, all sorts of things, who may be looking after multiple families in their community engagement. Without that knowledge of the, how uh, the reality of that life is for each individual person in the household, each woman in the household, um, or a person with disability in the household, or other intersectional uh, approaches, perhaps the information we're going on about what would really assist women may not be um, taking into account all the factors that we should be taking into account to. Um, for. So I'd really encourage you to think about, investigate where the data comes from, look for and perhaps invest in other forms of data that really are aiming to address that gap in knowledge um, that um, exists, uh, that maybe is informing decisions that aim to help, but are perhaps not driving off the accurate information. So I'll leave you with those two thoughts. And um, I hope that we can pick up some of those in the discussion. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, we've got uh, 15 minutes left for discussion uh, among the panelists and to respond to questions uh, from the audience. But Deborah, I'm going to be really selfish and ask a question which I think may be on the lips of some others. Very interested in the thoughtful analysis of funding movements, uh, the piece that worries me is will people steer away from it? Because as you said, there are less predetermined outcomes and it is going to be difficult to measure and attribute uh, specific outcomes to this. How, I mean, has I, is IWDA thinking about that, that piece of the, um, the message? 
Uh, yes, but I, I do think we're not sort of forging a brand new path. Yeah. Um, uh, quite a number of governments are, are investing in movement-based approaches, the Netherlands and the Canadians in, in terms of gender equality probably sitting in the lead there. Um, uh, that research and knowledge that movements are the things that make change is, is now very solid and widely accepted. Um, it does require people to take a leap from saying, I implement a project with a whole set of deliverables at the end of it to which you prove to me that I didn't, that I spent my money wisely. But you have to trade that off against the impact of investing in some individual women, investing in a specific project in this area and investing in systemic change that will have an impact for all of the women in that country or region. The, the change that happens when um, advocacy for things like more women into the parliamentary systems of countries mm -hmm. makes a difference for all women. But the people who do the work for that are really those women's organisations. Um, and we work with a particular one in the Solomons who's been working solidly on that step by step by step, moving towards a, a situation where the country will designate some seats for women to push that forward. Those things have um, benefits for women in the country, investors in the country, the stability of the country, all of those areas. So it does take a leap of trust, but it also is something that um, I think we can all look around and see and understand um, and have experiences of change that have happened those ways. And most um, social investors, you know, they have as their interest the social change they want to see. They may um, have money to just give or they may have money to invest, but the social change connects to that very strongly. Thank you, that was, um, thank you. I wonder if any of the other panellists, if either of the Julies or, or Roshini would like to, to follow up on Deborah's um, uh, comments about the fact that movement building and funding of movement building is about trust. Uh, or other comments related to the question. There is an, a current obsession about, about measurement and evaluation. And I don't see that, uh, I don't see that declining anytime soon. Yeah, um, and Ruth, I, I would just jump in to absolutely endorse what Deborah said. Um, and I think we can uh, look into history and say that those, you know, the major changes that we have seen have been because of the collective action um, you know, particularly if changes for women, um, changes action by women and by movements. Um, I was very lucky to do a Churchill Fellowship um, a couple of years ago and looked at what were the activation points in America where uh, funding did actually start to go to women. And it's so not enough and it will not be enough for a long time, but it was around um, the Equal Rights Amendment and, and a lot of those women's funding, uh, that women's funds that exist now in a very robust way were started as quite small grassroots community uh, giving circles uh, 40 or 50 years ago. So I, I would absolutely endorse that. And I think um, in some ways the parallel that we talk about in domestic philanthropy is about the importance of funding advocacy. Um, as you very articulately said, you can help one or two people, but if you can change government policy or practice, mm. you can change things for a lot of people. So um, that funding of advocacy and funding of movements go hand in hand. Um, and it's certainly, I think, something that people are, are much more open to in the progressive philanthropy area. Mm. Thank yep. you. I'm gonna leap in and totally agree as well. We keep mm talking about trust and there's no doubt you know, we had a webinar about building trust but I think there is also the intersection of triggers where people go and that's enough it's it's, it's enough and we have to do something else differently and you know just in the domestic thing you look at Saxon and Mullins we've seen amazing movements just actually bringing about legislative change unheard of in record speed of life, this next generation of women, uh, I think they're really stepping up and they're going, that's enough. And they're joining together and they are using 
absolutely the movement, but the tools that are available to them now, it's so much easier to build strength in, in numbers. Um, and, I, you know, I think it's amazing to see that that trust, which is so slowly built, is actually being acted on with triggers of people going, we've heard too much now, and now we're going to do something. So the right. I have to agree with you. I think what we are seeing is more and more champions, uh, people who are willing to stand up and, and be visible advocates uh, for other women. Um, I mean, we've seen this with the Asia Gender Network, but we've also seen organizations like Gates Foundation that's supporting community building, a collaboration, you know, stakeholder, multi-stakeholder partnerships. It's about... Um, having enough of a voice, right, that, that a politician will stand up and take notice um, and realize that this is the, the interest of the people. But it takes a lot of resilience. It takes time. Um, so I think movements like uh, Me Too or even the one about the little girl that you mentioned, um, when they capture the public attention and people start, um, you know, persisting and, and requesting, de demanding that change be made. I think that's when it happens. We've, we've got some... Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry, I just wanted to say one thing. I, I, Please. I, I didn't want to give the impression that there wasn't any measurement of the impact of movement, mm. movement strengthening approaches. Um, we, we have methods to um, measure those. There are targets that may well be things like number of women in parliament or laws changed, all those sorts of, it, it, it's probably just, it's not the same as a project where you tick off exactly when those things will happen. Um, part of the story is to say, this is where we're progressing towards. These are the things that we're trying to achieve as stepping stones towards this. Um, this is, these are the factors that have influenced those, but the strength of your movement has to be there to achieve any of those things. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to just, I'm going to just, just one last thing, but jump in with Deb, because when we were preparing for this session, what really struck me about the discussion that you were giving to us about movements was that it is very much locally led as well. It's not this idea that really in governments you are actually, IWDA is identifying um, communities and leaders and, as Rashini says, resilient leaders who actually are working in their communities and around a particular issue and joining communities together. And I thought that was really important in the movement. Mm. And can I just give you one other uh, that that before we get on to the other questions? Oh, sorry, Julie. Um, no, it's fine, I'm jumping. We also use this framework called um, Step Up, Stand With, Step Back. And um, because if, you do, if it is the importance of the locally led or the, the, the movement of the people affected by it, the role of um, somebody from Australia in Asia and the Pacific or an organisation from Australia is not to determine their strategy or um, run their project for them. Um, but we do have a role which uh, we use this framework, the step up, stand with, step back, to be clear about what our role is in relation to that movement Sometimes we step up, for example, advocating to our own government for uh, on issues that are affecting everybody in our region. For for their, or we might stand with by trying to assist in bringing resources and uh, capacity to those organisations, or we might stand back and say it's really important that they're they're in the lead here, and we're not taking the lead in this situation. Yeah. And, um, so uh, that, that framework is just as important as a sort of broader framework of supporting movements. Thanks, Deborah. We've, had a, we've got a couple of good questions in the chat box and in the Q&A. Uh, so one is asking what, uh, Rosh, you may, or, or it, this, these questions are for anybody on the panel, asking about uh, how, what kind of uh, resources are we seeing going into this issue, uh, impact investing platforms uh, and the like from uh, big influential foundations like Rockefeller, uh, Melinda Gates, what are they doing in regard to impact investment vehicles, vehicles 
and building sustainable platforms on these issues. Um, thanks, Liz, for your question. What I know is that the uh, Gates Foundation is supporting gender in all ways and forms. So um, building networks is one, they support direct intervention, so then they support programs that can be large and sustainable over the long time, uh, long term. They've got um, something called Goalkeepers with goal, goal, Goalkeepers Accelerator. Sorry about that. And this is critical funding to allow a scalable solutions to, to emerge. I'm not sure if they're doing um, anything to build impact investing platforms. Mm -hmm. um, Rockefeller has the Zero Gap Fund, which is not specifically for, for women, but it is for um, all SDGs to, to close the gap um, in funding. They've also got a, a fund for service-based small businesses. I think it's a nine million uh, US dollar impact fund. Um, and then there's also the Sasakawa Peace Foundation, which has the Asia Women Impact Fund. And that's specifically for women, and that's 100 million US dollars. Um, so they've got their own funds, uh, but off the top of my head, maybe Julie Riley can help. Uh, I don't know if they're investing into platforms, so to speak. Um, I'm not sure, Rosh, that I've got the answer to that either. Obviously, um, the Gates Foundation is a leader with its toolboxes and various um, mm. instruments to support a gender focus across everything. But I think what, what I'm seeing that's encouraging is a really growing interest, obviously, in, in impact investing and gender lens investing. Um, I want to make one observation that I think we all have a part in changing and that is that as often happens with our own events uh, at Australians Investing in Women, you'll have 95% women and a small handful of men. Uh, I was recently at a Gender Lens Investing Summit. Um, the first one that I think that has been held was in Sydney. And you think about the finance industry and the absolute male dominance of 95% plus um, men controlling capital markets we had 95% women in the room and um, yeah. a very small number of men. And so my challenge to the group was to say, look, if we're going to do this again, could each of us uh, agree a commitment that we would bring one man with us? Because, I, you know, you'd hear, talk to people afterwards, like, oh, yeah, I would, would have gone to that. Um, but we're just not getting that take up from those who've got uh, control of much larger portfolios and much larger decision making. So I agree we don't need to wait for that, but I think we can actively challenge men to get involved in this. Oh, good, good, good idea. Getting, uh, bring one, uh, yes, bring a, a two for, a two for one deal. Uh, we've got a good question here from Jake Milgram. Uh, he says, um, that his uh, investment, with his investment portfolio, uh, they are always wrestling with this idea. Is investing in women enough impact or do the businesses and the outcomes that they are running or setting up have to be, have to have impact as well? E, for example, is investing in a startup fund focusing on women, is that enough? Or should the individual businesses be reviewed from an impact perspective as well. Okay, so yeah, mm. I see I mean, where you're going with that. I think, I think you wouldn't be, I don't know. To me, you try not to invest in a business that will have a negative impact, right? Um, that, <laughs> that, that, that's, that's the basic. But if you're investing for women to grow as leaders, then, then that's why you're, you're investing in an organization that has um, uh, women in the leadership or if you're investing in women as consumers then you want to make sure that there are enough products in the market that address women's uh, needs um, so it really uh, does depend on how you are tracking your own contribution and you are tracking uh, your your so-called desired impact I think um, Julie, Deb you want to jump in? I jump in because I, I yeah. know that the work, the work um, uh, if it's the triple fund, uh, the triple fund does. The, there's a really careful, I think, and very robust attempt to maximise impact. And I, I want to just say I applaud it, 
my view would be that where you can maximise both, you absolutely ought to, but it shouldn't be a stumbling block to supporting um, sort of what I'd call first base um, gender lens investing. That would be my thought. Everybody, I hate to do this, but we've got to wrap up. We've hit the we've hit the hour. I know that we could keep going, and there are unfortunately there are more questions in the chat box that we didn't get to, but we'll look at them and see what we can do. Uh, everyone, uh, we are thrilled that you could uh, join us today, Julie Rosenberg. I'm going to hand back to you to farewell us, and thank you for the opportunity for us to have this discussion today. No, it was super cool, and thank you, everybody. And I totally agree. Like the enemy of good is better, but um, we've got to, we've just got to start and then hopefully get to great, and then it'll just become something that's just a non-issue. Um, and certainly before 135 years, that's not happening. It's just not on. Like forget it. Have to do something about that. I'm sure it's a typo. I'm sure it's not a typo. That's sadness. Um, well, Aidan's role in this is really to bring voices together, um, to actually explore, set the scene, and then primarily to take action. And like today's session will be recorded and there will be um, an email that goes around to everybody who's registered with all of the possible ways that you can get involved, learn more, Rashini's given us like some fantastic ones I'm going to go and explore myself that are there on the ground, um, links to movements. We're getting all things through the chats, good returns, got an animated um, gender lens investment. I feel like the time is it, and I'm sure there's been millions of times when that's been said before, but I don't know. Let's just mark it and see we, where we get to. Um, Mark Cuban always wraps up in his outro by going, there's no passengers on this network. You know, step up, contact us, help us, you know, fly the plane while we're trying to build it. So we look forward to hearing from you. And I thank um, an incredible group of women. And yeah, Jules, there needs to be equal numbers of fabulous men, of which we all know out there doing that, speaking up as well. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Great to have you with us. Great to be with you. Bye. Yeah, thanks for your time. Thank and you. Bye. Contact us. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Keep keeping that data.